there was a very strict ratio of buying in two growth properties for every cash cow, uh, but, but strictly saying those growth ones still had good cash flow. So it wasn't like going to buy a, you know, a 2.8% yield in Sydney house because that would just destroy my portfolio in terms of the income. This is Property Investory where we talk to successful property investors, find out more about their stories, mindset and strategy. I'm Tyron Shum and in this episode, we continue the conversation with Director of Rethink Investing, Scott O'Neill. He was able to retire from full-time work at 20 years of age. We'll discover how he achieved this through his highly structured strategy, why he's continued to rent vest and how to invest in properties that will keep you and your bank happy. For many first-time property investors, it can be daunting to take that first active step into buying a property. For O'Neill, the negativity from the media on the property market certainly didn't encourage him to invest. So back in 2010, I used to read a lot of forums, you know, just just based off the mainstream media. When there was a property article, you'd see hundreds of comments under each article, and most of them were saying there was a 30% drop in Sydney or Melbourne that was about to happen. So, as someone who's never bought property, I was extremely scared with the thought of losing every everything I've saved over the last five years, and it was a, it was a scary and daunting moment to even progress beyond that, but. My mindset was really around the idea of if I bought a property that was giving me cash flow each year, then I wasn't too focused on the growth. If it grew, it was a bonus. I always thought it was going to grow, but if it didn't, I was still getting that cash flow because the rent was higher than all the costs. And that made me feel comfortable enough to put at the time my life savings into a property. And it's just like treating it like a little business. It it was giving me enough income to justify you know putting all my money into a deposit and that was basically all, all that really got me started and then then I started forming my own opinions on property and I saw the results myself I started to know what was really going on and and I started ignoring what the mainstream article, articles were all saying about properties and doing my own research and just getting more and more thorough as time went on and the more research I did, the more confident I got to to progress into different markets and, you know, the strategy never really changed. It was always just buy properties that, you know, give give an income back and also have an upside in growth and if there was a chance to add value via equity, you know, like through renovations or subdivisions, that was a bonus as well. So I chased those. They say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Having built a substantial portfolio since purchasing his first investment property, O'Neill believes his mindset hasn't altered much as remaining cautious has proved to work well for him. Because when you've had equity to do things like developments or you know, I've been looking at investing in the US at the moment, um, also you know, you just get distracted a lot. Buying a family home, like we currently rent where we live and that uh, we don't want to change that but it's very tempting to look at a family home all the time because you know it's it's just like a basic human need which you've got to ignore but but sticking to the strategy has allowed us to buy more than you know most people but if we went down those other angles I think I would have made a mistake so I'm kind of like a quite a boring investor it just it hasn't changed because it, it works so we would you know my wife and I just continually do it and there's no reason why we won't have 50 properties in five years' time doing the same thing. And that's just tough to not get distracted though in in the meantime because, you know, like if we buy a house to live in in Sydney right now, you can spend millions of dollars and all of a sudden your cash flow is going to be reversed and it'll be harder to get bank loans and then you're just going to be chasing bad debt instead of a good debt. And and obviously rent uh, compared to buying a house is, is very cheap. In, as a comparison in Sydney at least. However, staying focused can't always be easy. 
His secret to maintaining discipline is the time and effort he puts into accumulating investment properties. But I draw a lot of inspiration out of you know, people like Warren Buffett. You know, he's got those investor rules like you know, rule number one, never lose money. You know, rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And it's just so easy to lose money in property. And we've got this strategy which I can't see a way of losing money. Like even if interest rates go up to 10%, we're still going to be in the best position compared to other investors and we'll hold through these invests at these higher interest rate times. So, you know, the, the chances of losing money are very, very low. And, you know, if we get greedy and just start chasing things like big developments and, that, you know, a developer goes bust, you can lose it all in one go. And it's taken us our whole life to build. And, and that probably goes back to the whole, you know, we value our time more than the value of money. And, you know, instead of just jumping into things that, you know, I'm not an expert at, I'll, you know, just continue on this strategy and use that other time to travel and, you know, work on the business or, you know, chase hobbies, stuff like that, instead of, you know, trying to chuck it all in one basket to double it. I, I don't like that mindset. Aside from Warren Buffett, Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad, confirmed what he already knew about investing in education. Everyone always says Rob Kawasaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I I read that after I started, but it really just consolidated what I thought. You know, I, I had that mindset of I didn't like education, even though I was doing it and I was doing further education. I just I always knew there was just something a little bit not right with it. Um, you know, I, even my thesis I did for engineering, I, I actually did it on how little the actual degree related to the actual work you did in the uh, you know as a graduate engineer because everything they teach you it's theory they don't teach you about you know how to deal with people or how to get a bank loan or anything to do with the real world it was all theory and that bothered me so I really related to to Rob Kawasaki because he not only spoke about the idea of acquiring good debt he spoke about the idea of living a life a little bit different to what we've been told to live, you know, get the degree, go work full time, you know, and then work until you're 60 and hopefully you've got enough in retirement to, to live a happy life. That model's broken and it has been for a long time and you know, this disinvesting was a way out of that old model. Collecting advice from various sources and drawing his conclusions has benefited O'Neill, which is why his property investing journey has been quite smooth sailing. Best advice would probably be more just collecting advice from many different people. I'm, I'm someone that will always ask a lot of questions. So you know, I'll ask my friends, my father, you know, about investing, all that, you know, my friends, other people in the game, just basically get the opinions on 20 different people and come to my own conclusion. And that has allowed me to never have a really bad moment in investing. Like I know I mentioned that I had a bad tenant moment, but I've never actually had a bad investing moment. Never lost money on a property yet. And it's just because I'm really conservative and ask a lot of questions and you know, make sure I don't bite off more than I can chew and don't make a decision until I fully understand it as well. You know, I'm, I'm looking to purchase in the US this year and I'll probably take three months of research before I even get close to thinking about it seriously and I probably won't do it. There's a chance it won't happen because I'll find too many problems with it. But I know a lot of people might just go, in that position, just go buy something over there. And then you can make that mistake and you know, end up selling it two years later. The safe strategy O'Neill stands by is to invest in properties with a high cash flow and those with good growth at a specific ratio. To go more into the strategy, it was really about buying in a ratio of two growth properties for every high cash flow. So my growth ones still were good cash flow, they had a minimum 6% yield on them, so enough to just cover their cost. And then one out of three properties was a cash cow, so it had an 8 to 10% yield on it. And that, that could have been a commercial or a unit block or a house and granny flat. But that cash cow is very important, even though that one may have not have grown as fast as the two growth ones, that cash flow allowed the banks to still look at me favourably and obviously give me an income. And then also the the capital growth was what created equity if I needed it to progress another one, you know, into another property. So there was a very strict ratio of buying in two growth properties for every cash cow, uh, 
that, that are strictly saying those growth ones still had good cash flow. So it wasn't like going to buy a, you know, a 2.8% yield in Sydney house because that would just destroy my portfolio in terms of the income. So it was very, very rigid, very structured, and that's basically what I still follow today. It's clear the strategy has worked for him. So when did he realize he was onto a good thing? It was probably about fifth or sixth property when I started having trouble with banks. They said, you know, you've got, you know, you've got equity here, but your incomes weren't high enough to keep going. So then to to get around that, I'd buy properties with very high cash flow. And and then all of a sudden, it, at the time, it just opened up the lending to, to squeeze that extra house in. And then I would uh, have a great result there. You know, a year later, that property's grown in value and the, the rents have all gone up across the board. And, and it, it sort of just allowed me to one step at a time move forward. And it didn't happen overnight. Every single property I've ever bought had been tricky for the banks at the time. Now, particularly when you get beyond 20 properties, the banks freak out sometimes. And they, when they really look at the numbers, then it starts, you know, you start to get treated on a, on a case-by-case example. And, yeah, I think the main message is it wasn't easy. It was just basically buying the right properties that, you know, would keep the banks happy as well at the same time. Coming up after the break, we'll delve further into O'Neill's property investing strategy. Without a full-time job, wouldn't have been able to get finance at the time. So when I uh, when I quit my job, I basically didn't buy properties for a while until you know basically I had a, a lot of a lot lower LVRs on my portfolio, and and obviously the rents kept going. How he built a successful portfolio, and I dropped this this envelope to. You know, maybe 80 different unit blocks and one came back. One came back and basically it was someone that had no idea what the value of their property was worth. It was five units in Port Macquarie. Ended up paying 710 for it. And that 710, that, you know, basically uh, it's currently worth around 1.2 million. And that's next. I'm Tyrone Shum and you're listening to Property Investory. O'Neill says that it is important to have sufficient income while he was implementing his strategy to satisfy the bank's requirements. So having a good full-time job was essential to this. And look, I was getting paid well. That, that, was, that definitely helped me move quicker. I was getting paid more than the average income. And that definitely contributed to myself buying a few extra houses than I otherwise could. But without a full-time job, wouldn't have been able to get finance at the time. So. When I uh, when I quit my job, I basically didn't buy properties for a while until you know basically I had a, a lot of a lot lower LVRs on my portfolio, and and obviously the rents kept going. So without a full time job, it was pretty much impossible to do this uh, with the current lending requirements. Um, but yeah, even after I, I nowadays because of the income and obviously I've got the business, I can I can easily get more finance if I wanted. Uh, but I'm more in a, a debt consolidation phase now. Uh, it's pretty line ball just because of APRA's introduced the new serviceability measures. I think they're up to 7.25 or 7.5% interest rates where they lend against, and then they only include a certain percentage of your rental income. So I'm I'm receiving nearly 800000 in a year in rent. So you could imagine if they only count 50% of that, it goes down to 400. So that basically will kill lending. So it's just the times are it's a little bit trickier to lend. Um, but these things will all swing around. Uh, you know, we're, we're not finding any issues with getting further loans due to the business income. Not with my clients that, are, that have jobs themselves buying these same types of properties, the full-time job there basically means I'll always get the loan unless they've got a huge debt level, which we advise against as well. In a short period of time, he accumulated many properties, which was achieved by communicating with many homeowners in the Port Macquarie region. In Port Macquarie, like I, I bought that first one, that was just an auction, open market, and because the result of that was so spectacular compared to anything else on the market, I remember I was just driving around, like I, I used to work there, so I, I would just write in my phone in the notes section just addresses of other unit blocks 
to the point where there was like a hundred of them. And then I just printed off a, a letter and say, I'll offer above market rate for your property if you sell it. And I dropped this, this envelope to you know, maybe 80 different unit blocks and one came back. One came back and basically it was someone that had no idea what the value of their property was worth. It was five units in Port Macquarie. Ended up paying seven ten for it, and that seven ten, that you know, basically, uh, it's currently worth around one point two million. Uh, that's with an unstrata, but I did strata title it as well. So we ended up, uh, you know, putting a fire alarm system into it, putting extra car parks, going through all the council, and you know that that was just another, you know, six seven hundred thousand in equity created on the spot just by buying something off the market that no one else saw. No one really knew how to value it because it was a unique product. Like five units on one title in Port Macquarie, they probably would sell less than one of those a year at the time. And it, and it also timed in well with the market. And that, that's the other side to it. I was up there for work. Like I knew they were building a highway, upgrading a hospital, putting a university in there. I knew there was all this infrastructure getting spent on top of it. So that kind of made the risk feel like there wasn't any. It was just pure opportunity. And... You know, I would happily go to the bank when I knew, you know, enough about the area to, to put my money in there. And it, it just paid off by just putting time into it. Like, you know, calling agents up, finding out what they have got coming up. And, and the letterbox drop does work, but, um, you know, you really need a lot of time. And I, I was lucky to have a job where I was on the road a lot. So I used a bit of that time to drop, letter, drop envelopes off and say, can I buy your property? A person of routine, Anil also takes the time to set goals regarding both finances and lifestyle, which contributes to his property investing success. So I wake up, uh, I make sure I sort of check all the emails in a routine because as I mentioned before, we put a lot of time into getting these properties sent to us before they go online. So basically treating them as gospel and making sure you get back to the agent quick or whoever's selling it to us and then present them to clients so it's a real routine of you know exercise in the morning check what properties we've got that's come across our desk present them to clients and then basically we're we're chatting all afternoon and can go quite late into the evening and it's yeah the the other side i i set goals probably you know once a year to say you know silly ones as well like spend at least three months overseas uh you know grow the portfolio by this amount, set percentages and also track it month to month. So there's a little bit of goal setting involved, but goal setting around lifestyle as well, not just money all the time, which which most people do. You know, this year, like even things like review, you know, wife spend, you know, at least one date night, uh, you know, at least three months overseas, uh, get to go to new countries, don't just go back to the ones that, you know, you like and you feel comfortable with. So uh, I'm learning Greek as well. My wife's half Greek, so I want to be fluent in two years' time. So I'm doing lessons once a week on top as well via Skype, and that's uh, another little thing. Um, yeah, it's just, just goals around that type of stuff. So it's really just time away for, from everything and just kind of not falling into the same pattern everyone does. And I know there's a lot of people in, in this industry particularly that, Brooke, you know, the lifestyle, but they don't actually live it. They're just smashing themselves behind a business, earning more and more money. And I just don't want to be in that, that ballpark with those guys. We just actually will live it. And, you know, the people that we work with understand what how we operate and, you know, it, it basically all works a lot smoother that way. To inspire you to work towards your own goals of attaining financial freedom, he shares with us what he's excited about being able to do in the near future. We just got back from Singapore two weeks ago, but in less than a month, we're flying to Europe. And it sounds a bit silly, but then we're going to the US, Central America, and flying out of South America. So we'll be in five different continents over the next uh, four months. So that we're, that'll be the priority for a while. And um, we're also opening a, like a mortgage business as well rethink uh, financing so we're just going to specialize in helping investors get finance so that's quite exciting and honestly just continually you know improve and grow our business uh, the rethink investing business and 
you know, that that's just basically a hobby. And I, I love the feeling of moving forward. Everyone does. And that's, uh, that's just the professional side. And, yeah, it'll... You know, again, next year as well, not to keep talking about travel all the time, but we'll spend six months in Europe in 2018 as well. And hopefully by then I'll, I'll have to be fluent in Greek so I can keep up if we're in Greece. To put things into perspective, Anil also shares what his property investment portfolio is worth and how much passive income is generated. Currently, it's around this $11.5 million and the income is around 305000 a year after all costs. Wow, fantastic. So there's about 305,000 in rent and you know that's off off around 750,000 in rent and you know as an example like our interest bill is, is less than 300,000 so you can see that we've had a lot of cost in there to come up with that income and you know it's still 305 ahead and that that's pretty much been sort of that's the only thing I look in my portfolio now I don't really care too much what the total value is worth it's about that income to connect with scott and neil so the best way to connect to rethink investing would be just email info at rethinkinvesting.com.au and any properties we send you are basically going to be the same types of properties that me and i and also the buyers agents that work for for me buy themselves so it's, it's basically a very family type feel we, we will only ever send you stuff that we would be buying ourselves and that has allowed us to have a very fast growing business word of mouth is how we get 90 percent of our clients and we just want to uh, work very one-on-one with you and you know, contacting us via that email would be the best way and then we just start chatting and work out what your goals are and we'll basically try to help you also build passive incomes and there's many stages to that you know, it might be involving high growth residential to start with, moving into high uh, cash flow residential, and then later on we might help you look at commercial assets because they're the real big kickers to get you that extra income. Even when you've got some, uh, you know, you're running out of lending capacity, those ones can sort of be uh, looked outside the normal lending scope sometimes. So we are we help you through all of that, and yeah, we'll we'd love to help you out if you uh, email through. It. Thank you to Scott O'Neill, our guest on this episode of Property Investory. If you want to hear more about his journey, then visit our website at propertyinvestory.com. Simply type in the search bar Scott O'Neill and select that episode to learn more about his story.